worship our God this morning. He is good. He is faithful to us. So can we sing this morning? So let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my, he is good. You are good, you're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song and let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song and let the king of my heart Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my face, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my star. You are good. You're good. Oh, oh and you are good. You're good. Oh, oh, you are.
when all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, and so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all, when all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, the battle belongs to you And almighty fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God And almighty fortress, you go before us and Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows, you win every battle Nothing can stand against, sing almighty and almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of surrounding me let it break at your name and still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way 
at your name in Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear and Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus and breathe Call these bones to live and call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus and Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble and Jesus, Jesus, we cry your name. You silence fear and Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble in Jesus, Jesus. We cry out His name, Jesus. In Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble in Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Your name is a light. And your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. And your name, it cannot be overcome. And your name is a light forever lifted up. And your name cannot be overcome. The shadows they can't deny your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, your name, your name. is in you all our hope is in you <laughs> we just take a moment and just say his name just say Jesus Jesus we call on you Jesus everything we see going on in the world we call your name Jesus in those circumstances in those places where there is darkness Bring the light of who you are, the light of the world. Jesus, so worthy. 
We're going to sing one more song this morning, and this song talks all about the kingdom of God. And uh, we know through Scripture one of the most powerful prayers that we can pray is your kingdom come, your will be done. And when we look, as this song reference to it, all the darkness that we see in the world, war, violence, unrest, uh, political unrest, so many things that we see, our response is not to be defeated or to scale back, but to actually push through the name of Jesus and to to pray that his kingdom would come where there is darkness, that his kingdom would be bring light. And uh, as, as we sing this song uh, that talks about the kingdom of God, can you do two things? Number one, can you just pray that the kingdom of God would infiltrate those places that need it the most, which is everywhere. But when you think about the things that we're seeing in the headlines, just pray that the kingdom of God would come in power. Let this song be our prayer in that way. Number two, would you consider how God may be inviting you to participate in his kingdom work? Because that's what we get to do as followers of Jesus, empowered by the Spirit. We get to bring the kingdom with us wherever we go. So let's sing this song together. Your kingdom is simple, as simple as love. You welcome the children, you stop for the one. We want to see people the way Jesus does. Your kingdom is simple, Lord, teach it to us. Your kingdom is humble, as humble as death. His king is a savior who gave his last breath. So may we die daily, our pride laid to rest. His kingdom is humble, and the broken are blessed. Hallelujah, so hallelujah, hallowed be your name, may we live and breathe your praise, hallelujah, and hallelujah, let all creation say, may the King of heaven reign. Kingdom is near, alive and awake, now working our tears. Lord, come to us quickly, forever our prayer. Your kingdom is coming, Lord Jesus, come near. Your kingdom is backwards, 
it flows in reverse what you call a treasure this world calls a curse the small become great and the last become first your kingdom is backwards lord teach us to serve as it is with your kingdom let it be with your church oh. hallelujah hallowed be your name may we live and breathe your praise and in this place of worship uh, we're going to turn to giving uh, but to do that I want to put a psalm on the screen just one verse from Psalm 107 uh, and in a moment we're going to say this out loud together as an extension of our worship as an extension of our praise because uh, I think that this statement an ancient prayer that was not just prayed by early Christians but was prayed um, in Judaism before it is the foundation for everything else and so let's all read this out loud together on the count of three. One, two, three. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. 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 And uh, I don't know about you, but um, I'm a words of affirmation guy. Okay. So after service, if you want to give me a word of affirmation, like we just did for the Lord, you can do that. Uh, but what tends to happen is the way you like to receive love is often the way that you give love. So early in my marriage, I would just tell Bethany all these compliments and she was stoked on that, obviously. But after a while, she started to say, you know, it's not just about what you say, it's about what you do. Uh, and I think for us as worship, often our worship is our words, what we say, it's beautiful. But what about worship as what we surrender? And so I come into giving this morning saying, Lord, what can we surrender as people? Not just what can we say about you, but how can we say, you know, you are holy, you are good, you are loving and kind and gentle and generous. And so we don't just say that, but we offer ourselves, we give our offerings as a pleasing gift to you. And, and the prophets would have something to say even about that. They don't just say, hey, just, it, it matters what you say and it matters what you surrender, but it actually also matters who you serve. And so what if our offering included all three this morning? What we say of God, what we surrender at His feet, and who we choose to serve as we step into the rest of service and to the rest of our Sunday. Uh, so I wanna pray for our offering. There's a number of ways that you can give uh, on the screen. Uh, most, the two best ways really are the website or the app, but there's also boxes around the room uh, where you can give that way as well. I'm gonna pray for us. Uh, that we can step into receiving from our generous God and giving, becoming like Him in that way. So Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, loving Father, we pray in Your name. We worship You, we honor You, we bless You. That's why we're here. We're gathered around Your presence. And Lord, as we worship You, we know we receive so much. And so now turn our hearts towards surrender, turn our hearts towards generosity as we give financially, as we give of our time, as we give of our resources. And then even now, would you highlight maybe one person whom we can choose intentionally to serve today out of an overflow of what you've done for us, out of an overflow of our surrender, 
Let it be so with us that we would love and serve one another in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, in that spirit, would you turn to somebody and say hello? And then after we say hello, we'll pass some baskets. be with you. My name is Ben and I get the privilege of leading our pastoral and formation team as well as leading our Sunday night service. So it's great to be up early with you this morning uh, and get to hang out with you uh, today. Uh, as you know, we've been in a season really in this year, this calendar year, we're really focusing on this area of formation. We're saying as a church, we don't just want to sing about Jesus or talk about Jesus or identify with him and what he's done for us, but we want to become like him in all of our lives. And in fact, I was thinking about this during worship. If you're here right now, there's a really great chance, a high chance, in fact, that you are here because you want to be like Jesus. What if I was going to, if I could tell you, which I'm about to, that this is just the tip of the spear, Right? This is just one expression. It, it, like, church is not less than the gathered community, but man, it is so much more. And there's so many other ways that you can step in, not just to all God is doing here, but you can step into what God wants to do in your life this morning. Uh, and we're going to talk about two different ways uh, for maybe two different places that you might find yourself that you can step in and become like Jesus through community with others. The first one that I'm so excited to introduce to you is table groups. Now, over the last month, we've been uh, recruiting and training table group leaders. And so they, I'm excited to tell you, there's a bunch of groups who are here today, a bunch of leaders who are excited to meet you and welcome you into community for this next semester. Our belief is that uh, uh, discipleship is not a uh, individual sport. It's a team sport. We become like Jesus, not on our own, but in community with others. And so... Uh, Table groups are exactly that. We gather around a meal, around the table, to do shared life together, to engage in shared practices together, um, sometimes discussion, sometimes communion, or other different ways of exploring practices together. Uh, and then we uh, learn together and share life together. And so I want to invite you into these. They last for one semester, and today we're not inviting you to just show up at somebody's house that you've never met before. The first step is to go outside after service, out on the patio. There's a bunch of tall tables, uh, kind of like this, but silver. And at those tables, you can meet the leaders of those groups. So you can say, hey, you're a little strange. I don't know if I'll go to your group. Hey, you're actually pretty normal. I would like to go to your group. Or maybe you're saying, you're strange? Me too. Great. I'd love to be in your group. Uh, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Uh, and so we want to invite you to go meet a leader. You're not committing to anything uh, that you don't want to, but there is an opportunity to sign up for a table group, to meet a leader, and to hop in for this semester. Uh, and what a powerful way to take the next step into the life of Rock Harbor, but also the next step in your journey of faith. Uh, there's another course I want to tell you about, another uh, expression of formation at Rock Harbor uh, called Alpha. And maybe you're saying to yourself, like, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I want to be like Jesus, but I don't really actually know that much about Jesus, or I'm exploring Jesus, or maybe I have, I'm deconstructing some of bad church experience that I've had in the past, or maybe I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with questions, and, and I, I feel like I'm the only one with those questions. We want to invite you to experience Alpha, to try Alpha. So to tell you a little bit more about Alpha, I want to invite up my friend Emily. Uh, so can we welcome Emily to the stage? And it's a little bit of a long walk, so we can keep it going for Emily. Come on, there we go. Amazing. Thanks, Emily, for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and so we want to ask you really two questions. The first one is this. Um, you were invited to Alpha, and it's so funny. I see the crew that invited you to Alpha for the first <laughs> time right there. Amazing. Uh, what did you experience, and what were you coming in with when you came to Alpha? Yeah, so growing up, I claimed to be a Christian. 
I would go to church on Christmas and Easter when my mom begged me to go. Yes. Um, and it was probably until recently I went through a very difficult season and I just needed to lean on God yeah. um, to get me through it. And to be honest, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. I didn't know how to do that. But I knew that it was like the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, that's good. Um, and so anyways, after seeing signs for Rock Harbor in my neighborhood, literally a sign from God got me here. Yeah. Like a sign Thanks in to somebody's lawn. Right? Cameron and Rachel. Yeah. Yeah, yes, amazing. literally yeah. The, yeah. the signs promoting Rock Harbor. <laughs> um, I had a conversation with my neighbors who at the time I really didn't even know. And they so graciously invited me to come with them to Rock Harbor that Sunday. And then after they just spoke very highly of this course called Alpha. So I was intrigued. Um, and then I think it was probably a couple weeks after that, um, Rock Harbor had actually promoted Alpha. And I was like, okay, yeah. I, I gotta go, I gotta go. Um, I don't know anyone, but I'm gonna go. And so I think it was like week two after attending and I just knew that this was the answer to my prayers. Um, there are prayers I didn't know that I had, but it was just a spot that I could come, I could be raw, mm. I could ask those difficult questions and not feel judged. Yeah, um, everyone was so, so open um, and to have me. And if anyone from that group is here, they could attest for me, like, I did not leave a week crying. <laughs> it, again, it was a very weird time yeah, yeah. in my life, but regardless to that, it was just so comforting to have this group that was so open to have me, where I could go and ask questions that are just so basic because that was my knowledge yeah. in Christianity. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just, we just became this little family, um, and we were there for each other, That's and it was, it was amazing. That's amazing. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about that invite, because you guys hardly knew each other, and yet they had the courage to invite you. What did it mean to you as somebody who's kind of around Christianity but not really active in a faith with Jesus in a challenging spot in your life? What did it mean for you to get that invite from them to come to church and then to come to Alpha? Yeah. So... It's so funny because I look back at that season of my life and it was like, I wasn't taking it day by day, I was taking it minute by minute. Yeah. And I can actually look back at that time and smile. Yeah. Um, and th there was someone in my group, it was like probably halfway through the course, and they just made me have this like light bulb moment where I was like, dang, maybe this really difficult thing happened to me to bring me to right here, yeah. right now, wow. um, to grow my faith um, and show me what it actually means to be a Christian and to love Jesus and trust in God. And I'm just so unbelievably grateful for Alpha. It just has truly led my path in life to so many more amazing things like being more involved with the church and now being a leader in Alpha. Um, and you went to Mexico too, I right? went to Mexico. Yeah, I did a Me the Mexico mission trip, which I actually met my life group through them. And they are just some of my very best friends. And had my neighbors have not invited me to Alpha and also encouraged me to try it, none of this would have happened. And it's crazy because that person I was prior to Alpha and that person that stands here today is completely different. And I just encourage anyone that maybe is here and is going through a difficult season themselves, um, or maybe you just have like really, really tough questions yeah. and you want answers to them. Or maybe you have someone in your life or know of someone that could benefit yeah. from that. I just encourage you to extend that invite because 
I'm just one example of someone who has experienced Alpha and just truly had it change my life for the better. That's amazing. Come on. So good. All right, so if you're here today and you're saying, yep, I uh, have questions about Jesus, about Christian faith. Maybe I'm deconstructing. Maybe I'm just wrestling. Um, if you find yourself in a similar boat to Emily, me and Emily right here, right now, are inviting you to come to Alpha. Uh, we have two locations, one at um, Work in Progress, Whip Coffee, uh, and uh, the other one at Green Cheek, uh, both on Randolph Street here in Costa Mesa. And we would love to invite you to that. But also, as Emily shared, if you're, you know, thinking of people in your life. Maybe there's another Emily in your life who you can invite into Alpha. And it's as simple as inviting, say, hey, will you come with me to Alpha? Will you come with me to Alpha for a free meal? Uh, and we'd love to uh, invite you on the journey. Uh, so can we give it up for Emily? Thank you, Emily. All right, well, we're gonna um, dive into God's word. And, and you've already heard a lot this morning and there's lots of different ways to step in. Uh, we're going to talk about relationships today, which is another way that we can step in and follow Jesus together uh, in every area of our life. But I just want to pause for a moment uh, and lead us in prayer to center ourselves to receive everything God has for us this morning. So Jesus, we love you. We're gathered around your presence, but not just to have an encounter. Or as beautiful as encounters are, as uh, powerful as encounters can be, we are here to encounter your presence and to be formed by your presence. Not just for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of the whole world. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you in our midst and we pray that you'd form us into the image of Jesus. Amen. Morning, Rock Harbor. I'm still trying to pick, my, put myself together after that worship time, man. I was like a wreck. Wasn't that something, man? Yeah, we can give the Lord praise for that. That's, I think that's. I don't know if you sense it, and maybe I'm a bit of a touchy feely kind of guy, but I, those are the moments where I feel like Jesus, you were doing something special here in our church, and I'm just so overwhelmed by it. And I know some of you, maybe you're newer, you're just starting to come to Rock Harbor, or maybe you're coming back, and you're like, what's this going to be like? Now, I wanted to just take a, a, a minute here and just tell you how we shape our teaching section of the service each week. So we, th this is a church that we're going we're gonna to open up the Bibles every week. We're going we're gonna to preach the Bible. We're going to teach the Bible. But we're going to get to the Bible in a few different ways. Sometimes we're going to get to the Bible directly. Like our next series that we're going to launch next month, middle of next month, is going to be on the Lord's Prayer. And so that's a series where we'll work through line by line through the Lord's Prayer. Uh, later this fall, we're going to work through the Gospel of John, and we're going to focus in on the specific stories of individuals who had encounters with Jesus in John's gospel. But there are others, so there are times when we'll, use, we'll, we'll teach the Bible directly that way. Other times we'll get to the text through a topic that maybe we have questions about. And we want to say, how do we think about this? For example, after Easter, we're going to do a long series called We Believe. And if you're saying, what is it that Christians believe? And, and, and what, what do we say about Father and Son and Holy Spirit? And what is all this stuff? And we're going to use the, one of the oldest statements of Christian confession. And we're going to find how it actually came from the phrases and the words in the New Testament. And so we're going to use the scripture to inform that, but we're going to get to it a different way. Does that make sense? And then this series that we're in, The Intentional Year, what we're really trying to do is to say, God, what does your word say about our life with you? And I think what, what, what we recognize is we're being offered lots of different stories to live within. And the world that we live in says, hey, here's a story. Pursue the story of accumulation or pursue the story of achievement or per pursue the narrative, the, the great narrative of uh, making your, your life more productive. But when we open up the scriptures, we actually discover that God is inviting us into a different kind of story, a story that even from Genesis, when he created the human beings, Adam and Eve, 
is a story of in being invited into fruitfulness, where God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So the intentional year is a, is a series about how we can join God in his work of producing fruit in, in our life. And that's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. I think that's what we all want for one another, isn't it? That we want our lives to bear fruit for the glory of God and for the good of the world. And so week one of the series was that. Week two was a prayer practice that taught us how to actually present the season that we've just come out of and present it before God. We, last week, uh, Todd and Lisa did such a beautiful job. And just thank them. They're sitting here today. Thank Todd and Lisa for guiding us last week. I, I just love so much the, the pursuit of the presence of God. And Todd, I mean, that's like a legacy piece to Rock Harbor as a church that, and you felt it this morning, that pursuit of the presence of God kind of stuff. And I, I hope you know this. I, I can't remember who said this. I don't know if I read this somewhere or a mentor said this to me, but uh, from now on, it's going to be my saying. Um, but, but someone said to me, if you don't teach your church how to pray, you're going to have to entertain them every week. And I, it is good. Just, I've, I've, I've always said that. You know, I've always said that. And, uh, <laughs> um, but I, why, why we fell in love with each other at Rock Harbor is we, we, both, we all believe that. We believe that about what it means to be the people of God. And so I know this is a series that you're like, what, what are we doing here? These practices feels kind of retreat-like, workshop-like. Think of it as it's the word of God informing us and forming us to be people of prayer, to be people of prayer in our whole lives. Does that make sense to you? Okay, great. So we're in the series and we're, we're pivoting now in the series and we're going to look at five areas of our life. And I think we have the graphic for this, five different spheres of our life. There it is. Prayer, rest, renewal, uh, work, and relationships. And it's beautiful because at the center of this is the love of God. What we're trying to, to say is we don't want to live our lives in a segmented way. We don't want to say, well, I got my church life, but then this is my work life, and I need to do less of my work life so I can increase my prayer life. No, what we want to say is let the love of God permeate your whole life. Let the love of God flood and fill your whole life. And so over the next few weeks, we're actually going to combine some of these. Next week, we're going to combine work and rest. The week after that, it's going to be prayer and renewal. But today, we're going to talk about relationships. What does it mean to cultivate meaningful relationships? Now, I, I've told you that my wife is from a small town in Iowa, which again, I could just say she's from Iowa, and uh, that would be enough. But the, <laughs> I told you about meeting my father-in-law for the first time. I didn't know he was going to be my father-in-law, but things went well. Um, but but what I didn't, what I haven't told you about yet, it was meeting Holly's grandparents. I mean, these are people who you know farmed themselves, and you know, you farmed, they were farmers themselves. And and Holly's grandpa on her mom's side, he was really into a lot of hobbies. And so he was trying to bond with me. He was very kind. He was trying to connect with me. So I come over there, young college kid, dating his granddaughter. And he goes, uh, well, lad, do you hunt? And I thought, nope. Uh, and he goes, he tr you know, he's trying again, maybe a less violent version of this. He goes, do you, do you fish? And I was like, mm, not really. Um, and he goes, do you play pool? And I said, mm, I didn't want to say yes because I'd embarrass myself. So I was like, mm, a little bit. I dabble, you know. And then the great Midwestern question, do you play cards? And I was like, well, I mean, Uno. And he just stared at me like. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he goes, well, lad, what do you do? And I was like, well, I, I like to read. C.S. Lewis is a favorite of mine, you know. I didn't really say all that. I, I, and I, I, I struggled. Finally, over time, we, we could connect on... Um, you know, Thanksgiving Day football, because I would see him over the holidays. We'd talk NFL, we'd talk sports, and actually over the years, it was really sweet. We developed, uh, a, a, you know, a good enough sort of flow in, in relationship and friendship that when he passed away several years ago, uh, the family asked me to do the funeral, which was a beautiful experience because going to the small uh, Midwestern town, the church where they had been at, and you know, everybody's like a long timer and I'm the, you know, the out of towner, the very out of towner. And, uh, and I, got, I got asked to do, I got asked to do the funeral, which was a, a great thing. But it was C.S. Lewis who said that friendship is born the moment that you look up and you see someone else on the same path and you go, oh, you too? 
That friendship is sort of forged when you find the sort of common ground or common journey or common path. And it's one of the reasons why friendship is so easy when we're young, because you're like, you're in second grade, I'm in second grade, sweet, you know? It's like, that's all it takes, you know? It's easy. And then you get older and you're, you start judging people, you're like, oh, you're making a different decision than me. Oh, that's how you handle your vacation times. And then, you know, our, all, all of our life starts to kind of shift. But it's not just that we lose common ground, we actually pick up the pace in life. And busyness uh, impacts the, our, our time with friends. Uh, Harvard University did a, did a survey during the fall of 2020 on loneliness. And what they discovered was 36% of American adults report serious loneliness. And what they defined as that is the, the feeling of lonely they felt frequently or almost all the time or all the time. So frequently, almost all the time, or all the time, 36% of American adults said yes to that. Now you say, well, okay, that's not too bad. It's about a third. Okay. But slice the data a little bit differently, and this is what you get. Mothers of young children, 51% of mothers of young children said, yeah, that's me. Lonely all the time. 61%, this is the one that surprised me, 61% of young people between 18 and 25 61% of people between 18 and 25 said, yeah, almost all the time, all the time, frequently. Could it be that we're in this age of constant digital connection and yet a feeling of loneliness and disconnection? We talk about meaningful relationships this morning. You say, well, Glenn, isn't that obvious? Isn't that simple? Like, why isn't this elementary? It's actually one of the most important human things. I don't know if you've heard of the study, it was called the Grant Study. It's the longest study on happiness that has ever been done. It started in 1938 with 268 college students. It started in 1938 and they just concluded it in 2017. The longest study that's ever been done on human happiness and they came up with one key ingredient. Do you know what it was? Close relationships. Close relationships more than money or fame, this is a quote from their report, close relationships more than money or fame are what keep people happy throughout their lives. Those ties protect people from life's discontents. They actually help to delay mental and physical decline. They're better predictions of a long and happy life, more than social class, more than IQ, even more than genetics. So when we talk about this, we're talking about it because it matters and it's a growing sort of problem. But actually, when we open up the Bible, we don't get very far into the scriptures before God tells us that we need this. Genesis 2, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the human is alone. This is incredible because if you've read Genesis 1 and heard it being read, there's a rhythm that kind of happens in Genesis 1 where it says, God made this and he called it good and he makes the stars and the heavens and he makes the creatures in the sky and the sea and the land and he calls it good and there's almost this poetic cadence to the story it is good it is good it is good it is good and then in genesis 2 which is sort of a retelling there's an overlap in the timelines maybe a slowed down version of the story and you hear instead of lots of it is goods you hear one it is not good now keep in mind that this is before the fall this is not God talking about, oh, it's the effects of sin in the world. If, I, if there was no sin, I wouldn't need anybody. <laughs> I got news for you. The scriptures tell us that even in your creational design, you were made for relationships. God made you for relationships. This isn't a flaw in you. If you say, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just want friends. There's nothing wrong with you. You were made to want friends. I don't know if you think your ideal is that you're supposed to be like a stoic kind of Dr. Spock sort of figure. That was for the older crowd, Dr. Spock reference, you know. It's just, just like, I don't need anything. I'm not affected by emotions or people. That's not God's dream for you. God's dream for you is to be in community. God's dream for you is to be in relationships with people, meaningful relationships. Now, we know the Genesis story is a setup to God creating marriage, Adam and Eve, but I want to say to you that actually the scripture has a, a, a robust vision of relationships 
beyond just the one that we think of when we think of Genesis 2. It's more than just the male-female marriage relationship. There's meaningful relationships. And so the question we're going to wrestle with this morning is how do we cultivate meaningful relationships? How do we cultivate meaningful relationships. And we're going to jump around in several scriptures. We're, we're going to be in the Psalms. We're going to be in the Proverbs uh, for, for the bulk of it. We're going to d- dip into 1 Corinthians, and then we're going to end with uh, John's gospel. And I want to say three things to us about how to cultivate meaning relationships. And I think we see this in the scriptures. And the first is this, invest in a constellation of relationships. We actually need to invest in a constellation of relationships. Maybe the thing that hurts us, has hurt me in the past, is the illusion of the one best friend. The illusion of the one best friend says, if I could just find someone who is like me, my soulmate, my kindred spirit, then I'll be fine. I'll just go through life that way. Years ago, I read a book by some authors who had spent a lot of time studying leadership and relationships and community. And what they, what they proposed in the book is this idea of instead of searching for one north star, look for a constellation of voices. Instead of searching for one north star, search for a constellation of relationships. And I love that image. Sailors, when they navigate navigate by a constellation. This is the old world sort of sailing pre-GPS, right? You're navigating by a constellation. I need a few different lights in the sky to help me know where I am and where to go. You need different kinds of voices in your life. And maybe what's keeping you from even joining a table group or, 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 or taking a risk on a friendship is you're like, you, you have this really great standard, but if they don't check all the boxes, then you're like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to spend time with them. And you say, well, what if, but what if they could be this kind of a voice? You know? So I want to suggest to you, I want to take a moment. Well, let, let me read this to you. See, here's how Psalm 1 says. By the way, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, um, uh, Ecclesiastes, Job, they're, they're part of what the Hebrews called the wisdom literature. And wisdom literature is beautiful because it's not rules. It's not law. But it's, hey, here's generally the way to walk uh, in, in God's way. And the, the Psalms start out this way. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now, right away, the psalmist is saying, you already have a constellation of relationships in your life. You already have one. I mean, it's kind of like saying, the, the issue is not, do I have relationships? For some of you, it's, you've got them. It's just the wrong constellation. It's the wrong people. You got voices of the wicked. You got voices of sinners. You got companies of mockers and cynics and skeptics. And you're like, that was not the people. And the psalmist says, your delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, that's not all the psalmist is going to say. If we keep reading the psalms, it talks to us about joining the company of the righteous on their way to the house of the Lord. But I want to suggest to you that Proverbs gives us a constellation of relationships And so I want to name a few of them for you. I want to name five of them uh, for you as we work through the Proverbs. Proverbs 13, verse 20 says, Walk with wise people and become wise. Befriend fools and get in trouble. Now, as a preacher, I'm always always trying to find ways to, to say things that help you remember them. And as I've thought about this constellation of relationships over the years, I've thought, actually... The perfect way to help you remember the constellation of relationships is the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the Fellowship of the Ring is everything you need to know about the friendships that you, the relationships you need, need left. Now, right away, some of you are like, yeah, we're going there. We have a nerd as our pastor. And so I feel the obligation to tell you I have not watched Rings of Power I've not read The Cimmerillion. I'm just confessing now. Um, in fact, when I read, I, you know, I read Fellowship of the Ring, and I started Two Towers, and it was so boring, I skipped to Return of the King. So I don't know if that brings me down in your book or not, but, or makes me like, okay, he's not that big of a nerd. So there you go. So I'm going to you know, take my losses here. But the first thing is, number one, the sage. And the sage is really like the Gandalf figure. <laughs> A sage in your life, they're not walking with you day to day. 
You, you, you know, like in Lord of the Rings, Gandalf is not with them at every step of the journey, but he shows up at opportune moments. An example for me, we actually have several different sage voices in our life. And over the last year, when we were discerning this move and this call here to Rock Harbor, we had several people that we called, several people that prayed with us, people that were local, that watched our life, and people that were around the country, some, some of them international. Pete Gregg from 24-7 Prayer in the, in the UK. Uh, uh, of course, Todd was one of those voices, but he was also a voice saying, you should come here, you know, which is great. It was the voice of God. In my, in my um, early 30s, there was a guy who, in, in, at that time, he was in his 50s. And I knew his kids. His kids were in the Air Force Academy. They were outstanding kids at the Air Force Academy. And I was working with the college ministry at New Life in Colorado. And so I knew all his kids because they were in the college ministry. And, and he one day asked me out to lunch. And I thought, this is interesting. I've, I know your kids, but I've never connected with you. And he asked me out to lunch. And he said, Glenn, I, uh, I just want to be a voice in your life. And he's like, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll pay for lunch. And, uh, and you, you, you pray. And we'll share, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about in your life. And I thought, wow, that's bold. But I kind of I liked it. And so we, we began to talk and we began to meet. And a couple, you know, maybe a couple lunches into our time together, he said to me, he's like, Glenn, I've, I've noticed something. You're getting fat. This is literally what he said to me. <laughs> no, he didn't actually say that to me. What he said was, Glenn, we should run together. And that's when I said, are you calling me fat? That, that's, that's probably the more accurate kind of thing. Yeah. But he goes, we should run together. And I said, why should we run together? And he goes, because I just think you need to like, you, you know, he didn't say it, but, but what I think he saw was I was getting sloppy. I was getting lazy. And he said, let's just, let's just get up and run together. And I said, I said, oh, Dan, I'm not a runner. He goes, that's okay. I'll teach you. And so we got up. I can't remember how many days a week it was, but it was like 6 a.m. And I couldn't bail on him. I mean, he himself had served as a, uh, as a JAG in the Air Force, you know, like an attorney. So like, Tough dude, right? Sweet, tender heart, but tough dude. Like, not the guy that you could say, sorry, Dan, I overslept my alarm. He'd be like, get out of bed, you lazy bones, you know? So we, we would meet on this trailhead, and, and we'd run. And some days, it was so cold. And I was like, Dan, I can't run. It's snowing. I grew up in Malaysia. He goes, you've lived in America for more than two decades. That's not an excuse anymore, you know? He's like, buy some running tights. You're meeting me on the trail, you know? And we did it. And we did it for like a good year. We ran together, and uh, it, it worked for that year. But he was a voice in my life. And here's my challenge to you. Some of you are in your 50s. You're in that exact stage of life where Dan was. And you're wondering, you're like, I don't know, young people, they're so lazy, <laughs> always on their phones. <laughs> so what if you just ask them out to coffee? <laughs> Say, hey, I'm going to pay for you. What, what, what do you want to eat? You're going to pay for me? Start something. And you don't have to say, can I be Gandalf in your life? <laughs> you don't have to. Don't, do, don't be weird about it, okay? Don't be weird about it. One time, just one time, just ask him out and see what happens. But it, it's, it's really like a comedy of errors because we have young people who say, nobody's investing in me. And we have older people who are like, nobody cares about my wisdom. And, I, and I'm like in the middle generation, I'm like 40, I'm like, can you guys just talk to each other already? <laughs> so I'm asking you as your pastor, take a risk. Be like my friend Dan. Ask someone out to coffee, to lunch. See where that might lead. You might just end up being a sage in their life. Proverbs 27 says, public correction is better than hidden love. Trustworthy are the bruises of a friend. Excessive are the kisses of an enemy. In other words, flattery and kindness, but from someone who really hates you is no good. But wounds or difficult words from someone that you can trust is actually really great. The second kind of relationship you need in your life is you need a king. You need Aragorn. All the single ladies are like, no doubt I need Aragorn in my life. Like, <laughs> Jesus, please. <laughs> you need... <laughs> I'm loose today, man. I don't know. It's just, it's over. It's over. <laughs> oh. <laughs> The Aragorn figure is someone who can say no to you, someone who can tell you no in your life. Now, I, it, it may not be that they carry actual authority, but maybe you've given them permission. 
Okay, so I'll give you an example. In, in my life, I, I do travel sometimes. I say yes to invitations. There are some people in my life that I've chosen to say, I'm going to run these by you because I want to give you permission to say that's too much. Uh, years ago, when I was starting my doctoral work, I went to my boss, Brady Boyd. You met him in October. And I said, Brady, what do you think? Should I pursue my doctorate? Now, technically, that's not his domain. It doesn't matter. what I could have said, it's none of your business, man. I, like, I work for, as long as I work for the church, it doesn't matter what I do on the side. But I wanted to give someone else permission in my life to say no. And I did. And he said, he said, I think you absolutely should do it, but you should say no to these other things so that you have capacity to say yes to this. That's wisdom. You need an Aragorn in your life, someone who can say no to you. Proverbs 27, 17, different kind of relationship, says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens a friend. This I think of is like peers. And in Lord of the Rings, the peer is like the dwarves. So the, the peers are like the dwarves. They're, they're not in the same battle, but they're in the same war. Okay, so this is what it could look like. If, if you're a parent who stays at home caring for kids, find others who are doing that same thing. They're in that same season of life. If you're an entrepreneur, find some other entrepreneurs that are in your zone. So you can, it's, it's the peer group idea, which is very popular in the business world, right? Ben and I were at a friend's church, a friend of mine's church up in Silicon Valley over the weekend, Friday, Saturday. And we just were having dinner with them. And Friday night, we were like, we just feel like we got a download of wisdom because we're just comparing notes. What, what is it you're doing for groups? And what is it you're doing for this and that? And you, you got to have those voices. I'm part of a monthly Zoom group with three other pastors, one in New York, one in Colorado, one in Alabama, like very different contexts. But the four of us every month for five years or, or, or more, that's my peer group. Where, 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 where is that for, for you? Iron sharpening iron. Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety leads to depression, but a good word encourages. Now, the Proverbs is not using these words clinically, okay? There, there, there's a place for clinical help, medical help. That's not what the Proverbs are talking about here. What they're talking about is, I think, a person who can be a healer in your life. In, in fact, in, in Lord of the Rings, it's Elrond and Arwen. You remember this, the dagger, poison, are you still with me, my Lord of the Rings people? Are you with me? Okay, that's great. I, you're really getting quiet on me. Is it because I said I hadn't read Cimmerillion? Okay. <laughs> Elrond and Arwen, they, they bring healing after the dagger of poison. L listen to me for a moment. This may not be a friend. This may be a counselor. This may be a spiritual director. But it is someone who can drain the poison and dress the wound. What we've been through as a culture over the last two and a half years, what you've been through even as a church, it's, it's difficult. And sometimes it's not until the adrenaline washes from your system that you realize, ooh, I'm a little sore about that. And we need people. We need help. Someone who can drain the poison and dress the wound. That's what I think Proverbs is trying to say to us. Proverbs 18, 24, there are persons for companionship, but then there are friends who are more loyal than family. Of course, in Lord of the Rings, it's Sam. It's Sam. It's Samwise. The, the famous scene where he goes, I can't carry the ring, Mr. Frodo, but I can carry you. Come on. Will you fail? You let me down. Like, Come on, people. That was it. It was Sam. Now. I, I, I have thought about this so much that I actually believe you can find this in the life of the Apostle Paul. And before I show you that slide, in my mind as a pastor, Paul is like the heroic leader who didn't need anybody. Paul is the guy that when he was in jail, he just sang songs of worship and then it was fine. But that's a myth. You know the part of Paul's letters that, that we preachers skip over all the time? It's the section with all the names. It's usually like the last five verses of all of his letters, but it's like name, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, thank this person, say hi to this person, and you're like, yeah, I don't know, Epaphras, Yodia, Syntyche, like, I don't know who these people are, so you just skip it, you know? <laughs> I think Paul had a constellation of relationships in his own life. Check this out. The sage in his life was Barnabas. Barnabas was a voice of wisdom who said, Paul, I see something in you. Barnabas was the one who called Paul up to Antioch and said, there's a guy who I think would be brilliant to minister to the Gentiles. Come on, Paul, come up here. Who was the person who could say no to him in his life? It was James. Read Acts 15. 
Acts 15 is the story of the, they're trying to figure out what to do with Gentiles, and Paul and Barnabas come down, and they're like, tell us, Jerusalem council, and James, King James, not King James, but he's the king role in their life, says this is what you should do. Who were his peers? Peter, Priscilla, Phoebe, who was a healer? Literally, Ananias heals his eyes. Who were his loyal friends? Epaphras, Yodia, Syntyche, Erastus. You read these names. Paul was not a mythic, heroic, solo figure. Paul needed a constellation of relationships. And I believe that you do too. The second thing I want to say to you about cultivating meaningful relationships is we need to spend your, you need to spend your time and energy wisely. Uh, several years ago, the University of Kansas actually did a study on how many hours it takes to become a friend. Isn't this interesting? And this is how they defined it. They said it has to be, it has to be leisure hours. So it can't be hours of like, well, we work next to each other in the same cubicle. But it had to be like, you know, relaxing on the couch, you know, at the beach, whatever. Leisure hours at home or at play. It takes 50 hours, leisure hours, to move from acquaintance to casual friendship. 50 hours. But it takes more than 200 hours to become close friends. 200 hours. So we're talking about table groups today. We're inviting you into that. You meet weekly for two hours. Uh Uh-oh, I'm going to do math in public. That's like a rule. I never do math in public. (laughs) 52 weeks times two, 104. You're halfway there. You stay in a table group. You have a good run with that table group. It works. In a year, you're halfway there. Two years, now you've got close friendships. Does that make sense? So here's my encouragement to you. I know some of you are new to Rock Harbor. You're coming back. It's, It's been a weird you know, the pandemic thing, maybe it feels like we're all sort of coming back to community. My encouragement to you is don't quit too soon. Don't quit too soon. You might be like, oh, I, t- I tried that thing. I went to that course or that table group and nah, just, nah, I don't know. Just, just maybe give it another go. Maybe give it another go after that and another go after that. Do a Bible study together. Find a way to log those hours because it's going to take hours to do this. I was at a conference seven or eight years ago. It was in Queens, in New York City, and it was at the Scazzaro thing, the emotionally healthy um, spirituality stuff. And they were having us work through these different categories of your life. What are your practices for prayer? I'm like writing it down. What are your practices for work? I'm like really writing it down. What are your practices of rest? I'm like, I got a few. And then it came to this question, what are your practices of relationship? And you know what I thought? I thought, wait a second. I always thought relationships were just sort of like, yeah, whenever. I, I, my, some of my closest friends that I went to college with, we were working together. So I was like, oh, I see him. It's fine. I didn't need to do anything. And then I realized, wait a minute, that's not intentional friendship. That's not intentionally cultivating relationships. So I felt the conviction of the Lord in that moment. I began literally texting friends right there. And I said, hey, um, would any of you like to like get together once a month and we'll just like share what we're reading and and what we're going through instantly people were like yes i'm in i'm in i'm in all of us at the time mid-30s hungry for that and i don't know if if you can relate to this but i my my just sort of non-statistical observation is i think it can be even harder for men and male friendship as you get into your mid-30s and it, it maybe it's because we feel like hanging out with my my friends like what am i in junior high you know i got stuff to do or maybe we just don't know how to actually have vulnerable like, relationships with, with other people. But I, I, if, if that story was any indication to me, it helped me realize I wasn't the only one hungry for it. These texts started coming back. Oh, I, I want to do that. I'm in. Count me in. When can we start? I want to give you three things that you might do, consider doing with your relationships. Discern what to do in each of your relationships. You can le- Some relationships you really need to lean in. Some relationships you do need to let lie. Like, it's like, I don't know, I'm investing in this. It's not, I don't know if it's working. Some relationships you really do need to let go. Like, you're like, it's just, this is not a good one. We were headed in the wrong direction. This is like what Psalm 1 was talking about. We're, we're hosting a marriage retreat here. Uh, Rock Harbor's hosting a marriage retreat at a different venue here in town in February. If you're married, that might be the one to say, I need to lean in. Oh, cool. Look at that. Man, wow, you got the slide. Well done, guys. It's amazing. (laughs) February 10th and 11th, Friday night, uh, all day Saturday. 
But that, you might say, you know what, when was the last time I intentionally like, leaned in to that relationship? To, to, if you're married, the most important relationship in your life. And so this might be an opportunity. So I'm going to lean into that, write that date down, see about registering to that. Go back to the let lie and let go real quick. Lean in, let lie, let go. I, I do think for some of you, because you're, you're, you're just coming into church, you're coming into following Jesus, there are probably some relationships to let go of. Here's how Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, don't be deceived, bad company corrupts good character. Uh, we'd like to believe that we're strong and we can always be the light in the darkness. I believe you can be. But I believe sometimes if you're always in the wrong spaces and you're always surrounded by a particular group of people, the influence is probably going the other way too. And that's what Paul's warning us about, saying it, it, it's just, maybe it's about ratios in your life. The final thing I want to say, we've got, we got to get the worship team up here and, and respond here, but the third thing I want to say is let the love of Jesus fill you daily. And this is not a throwaway to me because friendship is a huge theme in John's gospel. When we do our series on the book of John later this year, you'll see this, but um, John starts with that famous line, for God so loved the world, right? The world sounds so big. What you see in John's gospel is, okay, God so loved the world, but Jesus so loved his friends. You see Jesus weeping with Mary and Martha. You see Jesus eating with his friends, talking with them, praying with them, praying for them, washing their feet. John 13, verse 1 says, Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. It says he loved them fully. John 15, verse 13, it says, No one is greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. And then Jesus says, You're my friends. If you do what I command you, I don't call you servants any longer because servants don't know what the master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from my father I've made known to you and I give you these commandments so that you can love one another. Rock Harbor, I, I, I think for some of us, the answer is not simply to go be a better friend. The answer actually for all of us is receive the friendship of Jesus. Receive the friendship of Jesus because only when we have received the friendship of Jesus can we give the friendship of Jesus out into our lives and into the people around us only possible when we receive the love of God. Let the love of God fill you deeply. My goal for you is for all of us together is to really be an intentional community of people who are following Jesus. So I want you to stand this morning and we're going to do a couple things in response. The first thing I want you to do is actually pull out your phone and send somebody a text. <laughs> only time in church you'll get this uh, overt. Is send somebody a text. And if it's a, if it's a friend, you could say, I just want you to know I'm grateful for our friendship. Just say that. It's like super, super chill. And if you, know, if you feel awkward about that as a guy, just say, just add a few bros in there. And then it's like totally great. <laughs> hey, bro. Just totally great for you. Just text them that. And if you want to add another line, you could say, hey, um, Let's get together in the next couple weeks. Send someone a text. <laughs> yeah. Some of you, the other thing to do today is to actually take a risk and go out on the patio and say, all right, all right, let's see about this table group thing. Let's see about that. I'll try. Give it a shot. We actually have spots for about 100 more people to join table groups. Isn't that awesome? It's great, 100 people. Let's do it, let's fill them. Let's fill them. And then for all of us, I just wanna invite you to open up your hands and in this very moment as Caleb and Kendall and the team lead us, to just remember that relationships is God's idea. Friendship's God's idea. It's not a necessary evil. It's not a flaw in your design. It's what you were made for. And start with that friendship with Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need your love to fill me again. Some of you actually, there's wounds in your heart. You're like, oh, you know, I've been hurt. 
by people. I understand that. Maybe today, even in this time of worship, the love of God can begin that journey of healing for you. Maybe there's prayer ministry at the end of the service that can take another step towards receiving the healing in that wound of rejection. But all over the room, let's just open up our hands. Say, Jesus, we are coming to you today. You're the friend of sinners. You're the friend who loves us to the very end. You're the friend who laid down your life for us. God, let your love fill us today. Let your love wash over us today so that we can show a friendship to, the, to one another. In Jesus' name. And if my heart is overwhelmed And I cannot hear your voice I hold on to what is true Though I cannot see Though the storms of life they come And the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will believe And I remind myself Of all that you've done And the life I have Because of your son Love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me I am yours, I am forever yours Mountain high, a valley low I sing out in my, my soul I am yours, I am forever yours And when my heart is filled with hope and every promise comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me I'm staying desperate for you God I'm staying humbled at your feet I will lift these hands and pray I will believe, I remind myself, I remind myself of all that you've done, and the life I have because of your son, and love came down and rescued me, love came I am yours, I am forever yours, and mountain I valley low, I sing out in my, my soul that I Mountain high or valley low, I sing. 
perfect son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me and he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief the man of sorrow silent suffering oh blood and tears how can it be there's a god who eats there's a god who bleeds oh praise the one who would reach for me hallelujah to the son of son Distant and removed, but he takes us down in merciful pursuit to the sinner.
You know, it's so funny as, as the Lord works. Um, just before we even went into that last song, I had a sense uh, for maybe one or two in here who you've been in this environment now this morning. And, and it's funny because I didn't know that that was the last song we we're gonna sing. And, and the sense I had was you just feel like I see other people alive and I see other people free and I just wish I was. Um, and one of the cool things, we always have ministry time after service. We have a prayer team who would love to come alongside and pray with you. So maybe it's that word that resonates with you or maybe it's, uh, hey, no, I have relational wounds and I want prayer for that. Or maybe it's just I want more of God's presence in my life. I want prayer for that or anything that you're carrying. We'd love to come alongside you. So prayer team, would you mind heading now under the screens? We would love to pray uh, with anybody who comes forward after service. So as soon as I pray the blessing, if you want prayer, just head up to the prayer team. They'd love to greet you after service. Uh, a few ways that you can step in. Uh, we've already mentioned, I think all of them, but uh, marriage retreat. If you're married, uh, you do not want to miss this. A great way to intentionally invest in your relationship. Table groups. If you're looking for friendship, but not just friendship on the surface, but friendship that's becoming like Jesus together, community that's becoming like Jesus together, I want to invite you into a table group, meet a leader on the patio, or if you have questions about life, faith, you're wrestling, we'd love to invite you to Alpha or encourage you to bring someone to Alpha uh, kicking off soon. So those are three different ways that you can step in uh, in the life of the church this week. Um, so let me pray you out with a blessing. So extend your hands to receive. Jesus, I thank you that of all the things that you could have chosen, of all the ways that you could have chosen to relate to us, when you came in the flesh, Jesus, you chose to relate to us in a friendship. One, because I think it's what our heart truly needs to be perfectly loved. But two, so that you could show us how to love one another. And so I pray that as a church, far beyond what we sing in this place, would our worship to you be the friendships we cultivate, the people that we choose to go on the journey with. Would you stir up in our hearts? Where we're discouraged, give us courage. Where we're afraid, uh, would you help us to step out in faith? And Lord, I just pray for simple things now for this church. Increase the chemistry, increase the relational bonds, increase that I wanna be like Jesus, linking arms with others. Give us that courage to step out in faith and to pursue the relationships you're calling us to. So now Rock Harbor, we bless you in the name of the relational God, who's Father, Son, and Spirit, to go and be in relationship with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.